Great. Well, welcome everybody. And it is, my name is Dina Grossenbacher. I'm filling in for our president, which is Kathleen Kay. She's just getting back from a trip to Spain. And it's really my great pleasure to introduce Oscar Vargas, who's going to be tonight's speaker. And he's a professor and herbarium director at Cal Poly Humboldt, where he teaches plant taxonomy and mentors a ton of students in the principles of phylogeny construction and plant collections, and especially in how to do interesting things and test interesting questions with those phylogenies. So we're really lucky to have him here in California. He's originally from Columbia, where he earned his undergrad and master's degree in biology at University of the Andes in Bogota. And that's where he really started studying tropical Asteraceae in the genus Diplostephium. And that is this clade, which has just over 60 species. And they're mostly shrubs. There's also some trees. But what's neat about them is that they occur in the high Andes in the Paramo, which is this alpine tundra ecosystem. And it's considered an evolutionary hotspot for really high rates of diversification. And so much of Oscar's work since then has really been devoted to this idea of what are these drivers of diversification. So he completed his PhD at University of Texas in Austin, where he focused on drivers of diversification in tropical mountains using that same genus, Diplostephium, as a model. After his PhD, he did a postdoc at Michigan, and where I got to meet him was when he was doing a postdoc at the University of Santa Cruz with Kathleen Kay, and we got to collaborate on a project where Oscar constructed a complete phylogeny of the spiral gingers, another American tropical lineage, rapid diversification in mountainous regions. So since moving to Humboldt, starting his lab in 2020, he's really been delving into the California flora. And his research currently focuses on understanding the origin of rare species with limited geographic distributions. And he approaches this mainly as a plant systematist. And um, I'm really excited to hear this talk today. So please take it away, Oscar. Okay, thank you so much, Dina, for the introduction. And uh, thank you so much, uh, the Society, for inviting me to speak. So is everyone hearing me okay? They sound good? Okay. Great. All right. So yeah, so today is pretty, it's, it's actually pretty special for me. This is the first time that I'm going to be talking about my work in California. And um, I feel like this is my baptism to becoming a Californian botanist, in a sense. Um, so the title of my talk is Testing for Botany Speciation in the California Floristic Province. <clears throat> okay. All right, so this is the outline for my talk. So I'm going to talk about body and speciation. What is body and speciation? What is the evidence that we have for body and speciation? And then I'm going to talk about preliminary results um, about testing body and speciation in two lineages, Clarkia lingulata and Abronia villosa variety aurita. And then I'm going to talk about future directions, and then other plans that we have in my lab to keep testing this type of speciation. <clears throat> All right, so I, I, for those of you that have seen my talks before, I usually like to start with uh, this slide that shows the accumulation of vascular plant species in the world. Um, we can see that the diversity of plant species is not homogeneous in the world. We have places in the world that have higher accumulation of species. And those are shown here by warmer colors. So colors closer to red um, have higher accumulation of species. And we can see that there are several regions in the world in which we have these sort of hotspots of biodiversity, specifically plant diversity. Um, we can see that some of those hotspots could be close to the tropics, um, but also we can see that some of those hotspots, like here in the Andes in South America, here in the mountains in Asia, and uh, this in, here in these islands, could be associated also with um, topographic complexity. In terms of California, uh, we can see that California is right here 
Um, this is uh, the color here is difficult to see, but it's actually seven. So we, um, relatively speaking to the rest of North America, California has a lot of species. I don't think this is new for the audience that I'm presenting today. And um, because of the diversity of California and because many of the species of you know, plants and animals are unique to California, um, this area um, is called the California Floristic Province. So the California Floristic Province comprises most of the state of California, but it also grabs a little bit of Oregon, um, a little bit of Nevada, and then a little bit of Baja California in Mexico. <clears throat> so here is a map detailing the California Floristic Province. Um, this is, um, in this case, we can see that everything that is in color is part of the California Floristic Province. Um, this province is divided in sub-provinces that are shown here. I'm not going to talk too much about it. But uh, we can also see in this map that the provinces are overlaid over a digital elevation model that is showing the mountain. So um, colors that are closer to dark, closer to black are going to show mountains. So we can see that here, for example, in the eastern part of the California Floristic Province, we have the Sierra Nevada. Um, so the California Floristic Province comprises almost 7,000 taxa. Um, this includes species, subspecies, and varieties. And 42% um, of these lineages are endemic to this region, to the California Floristic Province. Um, in um, later, I'm going to be saying CFP. This is just referring to the California Floristic Province. Um, <clears throat> now, I really want to pay attention to that 42% uh, of taxa that are unique or plants that are unique to this region. Uh, we call that endemic. And I want to sort of save this number, 42%, in your brain pocket for a minute. Uh, because I'm going to talk about this number. I'm going to make a connection with this number later. So when we look at the geographical ranges in the species of California, and we measure how much each species occupies, and then we build a histogram of this, this is, this is what we get. We get that um, most of the species, so here we have the range size in the x-axis, and then we have the count of numbers of species. And what this study did was it produced some beans and just counted the number of species that have a specific range size. So what we can see here is that the majority of species in the California Floristic Province um, have a range size that is less than 10,000 10,000 square kilometers. Um, this is roughly the size of Humboldt County, which is, relatively speaking, a large county in California. So what that means is that um, the species distribution, the, the, the biogeography in general of each species in California is going to be very narrow. And that's why uh, we can say that 42% of the taxa are endemic to this region. Okay, so with that um, introduction, now I want to talk about body speciation, and hopefully at the end of um, body speciation, you can see the connection with biogeography. Okay, so what is body speciation? So uh, in the literature or in books, textbooks, when you're studying speciation, you have the typical example of allopatric speciation, also known as geographical speciation. A lot of these examples come from the literature in animals in which you have two species that are separated by a barrier. Um, either there was a dispersal event from one side to another, or maybe a barrier um, was created for um, some sort of reason. In this specific example that I'm showing here, I'm showing a landscape, so in this case, and uh, this gray is just the lowlands, and then this white are the mountains. 
And we can see that these two species are at both sides of this mountain range. Um, in a phylogenetic context, what you expect when you have geographical speciation is to see sister species um, being allopatric to each other. Okay. Now, when we think about budding speciation, um, we actually think about something like this. So instead of the two species being separated by um, geographical barrier, what we see here is that uh, we have a species that is widespread, that is represented by the black. And then we see um, the second species is actually next to the black. It's, it could be sympatric or peripatric to it. And in this case, um, what we believe it could have happened is that a peripheral population of the black species became adapted to a different environment, a different ecology, diverge from the species, uh, from the original species, and then became its own species. In this specific example, since I have this um, black species down in the lowland, and then this red species um, on the mountains, you can think that's a hypothetical case of ecological speciation to higher elevation. So when we think about body and speciation, we think about um, some specific predictions about it. Um, we expect that these two species are going to have some sort of divergence in its ecology. So as I mentioned in this hypothetical case, it could be difference in elevation, but in places like California, we have a lot of soil diversity. So you might have, for example, a plant that is endemic to serpentine that is being derived from another non-serpentine species. So that's what I'm trying to show here. So we have a species A is sister to species B, and we have ecological characters that differentiate these two species. In terms of geographical range, um, we expect one species, in this case A, to have a wide geographical range and then the derivative species or the species that is budding off is going to have a small range. So we expect to see high range asymmetry. Um, another language that um, I want to make sure we all understand before I go forward is that uh, sometimes we call this widespread species the progenitor species, and then I'm gonna call this smaller species that is more narrow the derivative species. Okay, so why is this important? Well, if we think about endangered species, if we think about rare species, we actually think about a species that have a very narrow range. So it is possible that um, many species that we have listed as endangered or rare species are the product of budding speciation. And the prediction is that they are gonna be small. So as after a speciation even happen, you expect this species to have a really small range and that uh, matches the distribution of many rare species and endangered species. Okay, so is there evidence for budding speciation? The answer is yes. And one of the papers that suggested um, prevalence in body speciation was a paper uh, written by Dina. And what Dina did in this paper, um, Dina studied the monkey flowers of California. So monkey flowers is um, currently are two clades with many species endemic to California. So it's a really good system to test what's happening with speciation. So um, how did Dina do this? Um, she constructed a phylogeny, a full phylogeny for all the species of monkey flowers in California. Um, this is a phylogeny uh, that you can see here. If you think about it, it actually looks a little bit like the clips that we saw on Monday, sort of like a ring of fire with beautiful flowers. <clears throat> 
And once you have the phylogeny, if you want to test for body speciation, that you want to identify sister species. So you, uh, so in these boxes that I have shown here, I selected three sister species pairs. You are going to select the sister species pairs, and then you are going to compare the ranges of these sister species, um, see if they are allopatric, sympatric, and then you want to see if these species have high uh, range asymmetry, and then you also want to see in their ecological differences between the two species. If um, all those things are correct, then you can, if you have those signatures of body speciation um, that I spoke about before, then you can say, okay, we have cases of body speciation. So um, what Dina found was very, very, very interesting. Uh, when she compared all these sister species pairs, um, she found that most sister species occupy distinct um, environmental niche positions. So what she did, she um, looked at these occurrences and then she put layers of GIS with temperature, precipitation, all these different uh, variables, and then she compared those variables to see um, if the two species are different. And then she also looked at the geographical distribution of these two species. So what I'm showing here on the right is one of those sister species examples. And we can see here on the right, the distribution of the two species. So we have Mimulus and Rosaceus in blue, Mimulus Shebaki in orange. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing those names correctly. Um, and what we can see is that um, typical signal that we expect from body speciation. The species in orange is very localized in a specific region, yet its range seems to be nested in this widespread species that in this case we can hypothesize is the progenitor species. Um, when we look at those niche preferences in terms of climate, um, we can see that one of the species is sort of in the periphery of the preference of the other species indicating some sort of ecological divergence that we can see here. Um, the, I think the, the, the most interesting thing about um, this study is that Dina found that 80% of the sister species compared have completely or partially overlapping distribution, meaning that perhaps in 80% of the cases, when you do these comparisons, body speciation was responsible um, for the diversification of these species. So um, I told you to save that 42% in your brain pocket because if you think about this, this 80% predicts that uh, 40, so if you just slice this in half, which is, um, you know, you have the progenitor species are half, and then the derivative species are half. This predicts that 40% of the species in Mimulus are gonna have a very narrow and restricted geographical range. And this, uh, this is very interesting because it matches that sort of 42% and the mism that we see in the California floristic province. So if we sort of put these two things together, we can say that, you know, perhaps body speciation is what, what is producing all these rare species that we see today. And I think looking forward, the question is, well, is this just something that is um, genus specific? Is this something that just happened to happen in Mimulus because Mimulus uh, has some specific property about its speciation? And the answer is not. Um, almost at the same time that Dina published her paper on body speciation in the monkey flowers, this other paper came out by Anna Karen Strauss, um, which um, from um, UC Davis, in which this paper pretty much did a similar analysis to what Dina do. 
uh, did, but they included 71 sister species pairs extracted from 21 different genera comprising 12 families. Um, all the genera and the families and the species are species that are found mostly in the California floristic province. So again, what the authors did, they build a metaphylogeny of all the plants found in the CFP uh, for genera that they believe there was almost um, full sampling for the species. So then your sister species inference is not biased. And then they compare the ranges uh, and the ecology for those sister species. <clears throat> All right, so um, the results are shocking. Um, Anna Karen Strauss actually found the same number that Dina found. Um, they found that 80% of sister species studied in this, um, in, this, in this paper are found in sympatry or parapatry. All of those 80% have signatures of ecological divergence and species pairs presented highly asymmetrical ranges. So all this evidence points that budding speciation seems to be prevalent, not just in monkey flowers, but in many species uh, in the CFP. Now, I want to... Um, explain a little bit this this graph that is actually in the um, supplementary material of this paper uh, in addition to um, um, to measuring the ranges they also look at different types of ecological characters so they look at habitat soil type growth form altitude flowering time um, the chromosome numbers and basically what we can see here is the proportion of sisters in the Y axis. And then in the X axis, what we have is a count um, of whether or not they found um, evidence that suggested a shift in this specific character. So for example, if we look at this, this roughly says that 20% of the sisters didn't change their habitat, but uh, more than 40% of the sister pairs uh, presented at uh, least a partial change in, ha in, in habitat. And then around like 30% presented, presented a full change in habitat. So what that means is that uh, when we see these two bars on the right uh, being higher, this is evidence of ecological divergence between the sister species. So we can see that in this case, um, for example, growth form is something that didn't change that much. So it was pretty much the same between sister species, but we can see that habitat, soil type, elevation, and flowering time presented some sort of signal about uh, divergence in these species. Um, so again, if we get out that 42% that I told you to save in your brain pocket earlier, um, you can see that this number, again, sort of matches that 42% of endemic species in the California floristic province. This number also matches what Dina found on her study with Mimimus. So, okay, so this is the introduction. And so far, we have learned that um, small ranges are very common in the CFP. And we believe that maybe um, the explanation for some ranges could be uh, the proper origination of the species, which is budding speciation. Uh, we know that both aforementioned studies uh, have identified signatures of budding speciation in sister species. Um, but I also want to mention that these studies are based mostly in phylogenies where a single individual was sequenced per species. So this uh, shows, this is shown here, we have uh, in this case a single sequence, a single sample for a species A, we have a single sample for a species B. 
So um, one thing that I wanted to do since I arrived to Humboldt is um, go a little bit forward and get a little bit or more of a shallow taxonomical level, if you want to call it that way, and then test other predictions of boring speciation. So if instead of sampling a single individual per species, we sample multiple individuals and multiple populations, we also get some uh, interesting predictions about body in speciation. So um, if we think about body in speciation, um, we, the prediction is that the derivative species, um, which is here um, in red and shown by the letter B, is going to be closely related to the population, to its closest population, which is a peripheral or close to peripheral population of this uh, putative widespread progenitor species. So what that means in a phylogenetic context is that um, the derivative species is gonna be nested in the progenitor species, making the progenitor species paraphyletic. Um, so what that means is that the progenitor species uh, is not a natural group because you can see that when we um, group all the um, taxa, all, this, all the samples in A, they don't form a monophyletic group. Um, they are derived from a common ancestor, but also include some um, samples from these um, derivative species. So um, the idea that we have in my lab is to test for body speciation um, at the microevolutionary level. So um, identifying these putative sister species and then sequencing multiple populations in these species and then testing for this type of speciation in several cases. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna show now are the results um, of a master's project by my student Eli. Um, Eli, it's uh, finishing right now. I don't know if he's here. I bet he's working his dissertation. And uh, I apologize with Eli for showing some of his preliminary results, but we're really excited about it. So Eli um, is interested in San Bernardinas, specifically in this putative case of body speciation inside Abronia villosa variety aurita. So um, if you are from Southern California, you might know this um, variety. This is the only variety that is listed, uh, the only variety of abronia that is listed as rare for California. So what we found with variety aurita is that this species um, is um, this variety it's, is different from the other variety, which is Abronia villosa, variety villosa, which is um, common in the high desert. And um, the color is a little bit different. Um, the peduncle is also a little bit longer in variety arita. And then you can see the hairs are also different. Um, variety villosa, which is the typical variety, has more hairs. So when we look at um, the distribution of this species, so this is a map showing the distribution of four species that Eli included in his study, um, we can see the pair that we're interested in. So this um, blueish Turkish dots, um, triangles pointing up indicate um, Abronia, Villosa, the variety Aurita. You can see that its distribution is spirit restricted, it's, it's endemic to California. And then you can see the sister lineage, Abronia, Villosa, variety Villosa, um, having a widespread distribution. Um, in addition to that, um, 
So here is here is a map, a closer look at the distribution in Southern California. And then um, we can see that sort of like split in distribution. So again, um, variety Villosa, it's more of high desert. And then variety Aurita, it's uh, in lower elevations. Uh, well, it's in the mountains. So this is, I guess, I apologize. I'm gonna backpedal a, a little bit. So Villosa, it's, it's, it's sort of in the flatlands. And then Aurita is actually in the mountains. So just based on those observations, um, we can say that there is um, a couple of signatures of boring speciation. So first, the range difference is indi indicative of possible boring speciation, but also these different habitat indicate um, possible different ecologies. So Eli went to the field, collected many of these species, many of these samples, um, used Umbelata as an outgroup, and then uh, produce a phylogeny for all these different samples. And this is what we got. So um, basically what we can see here is that uh, variety Arita, again, that is in blue, is monophyletic and is in fact nested in Abronia villosa variety villosa, um, suggesting that the divergence between these two varieties that are considered just varieties at this moment, um, it's a clear case of body in speciation. So this um, example shows that when we test body in speciation using high resolution phylogenies, um, we can actually see those predictions that I talked about before. Um, I wanted to mention that we did this using um, anchored phylogenomics. Uh, so for, for this specific case, we use the ANGU 353 set. So this is a set of 353 gen genes. Um, and what we did for this phylogeny, this is a concatenated phylogeny of all the data. So we concatenated all the matrices together and did one analysis. Um, you can also see that there is also really high resolution for um, Abronia bijosa variety Aurita being a clade, and all the nodes that are associated with Abronia bijosa variety Aurita being monophyletic, and Abronia bijosa variety bijosa being paraphyletic, um, are fully supported by um, our data. <clears throat> all right, so what we can say about this case is that in this case, the phylogeny matches the prediction of body speciation. Um, we have evidence for ecological isolation, and we're working on uh, measuring that using a similar approach of uh, what Dina did. And the thing that is interesting for me is that these two lineages are currently considered varieties. Um, we are trying to see if we can infer how much gene flow is between the two varieties. It seems that there is not a lot of gene flow between the two varieties. Um, and this is a case of speciation that is just happening in front of our eyes. Um, you know, if we wait a couple of thousand years or maybe a million years, uh, we expect these two species <clears throat> to be different species. All right. So that is a case of um, body in speciation that we were interested, we tested it. It seemed that it, it really checks out. And again, considering that 40% uh, we have in the CFP, we have 40% of endemic species. We, we really is, is, um, expect to find a lot of cases of body in speciation in California. So, um, the other case that we've been studying is the, clay, is the case of Clarkia lingulata. And it likely if you went to school in California, you probably read a lot of literature about these two species. Um, Herman Lewis from uh, UC Davis spent a lot of time studying the origin of Clarkia lingulata, which is um, endemic species to 
um, the Merced Valley. This species is actually found only two spots along the Merced River when you are going up to Yosemite. And um, it has been hypothesized that this species is derived from Clarkia bailoa, which is a wide, widespread species found um, in the western part of the Sierra Nevada. <clears throat> so um, here we can see and those distributions. Um, so these distributions are inferred from iNaturalist. So you can see Clarkia bailoa is widespread, so mostly at the base of the Sierra Nevada. There is a couple of populations close to San Francisco, um, but very widespread distribution. And then you can see Clarkia lingulata. This map is actually not accurate. Um, this is because I naturalist, because Clarkia lingulata is an endangered species, so I naturalist is masking the real points. Uh, it should be a single uh, pixel here. But again, what I wanted to show here, this is a really, really narrow endemic species with only two populations that are basically half mile from each other. So there is a lot of literature about these two species and these being considered a case of um, body speciation for a long time from the 60s, 70s, when Lewis published a lot of these papers. And <clears throat> I'm gonna be honest with you, I didn't know some of this literature. Maybe if I have known that there was so much literature about these two pair of species, maybe I had not studied. Yet I decided to obtain the permits, um, go and collect these species, and then sequence them. And these are the results of my um, sequencing. So here in red at the bottom, you can see Clarke lingulata is monophyletic. Um, that's fine. We're expecting that for the derivative species. But then when we look at Clarkia bailoa, Clarkia bailoa is also monophyletic. So you can see that it forms a group. And what we can see is that Clarkia lingulata is not really nested inside Clarkia bailoa. So this actually suggests that this is not a case of body speciation and something else is going on here. Furthermore, you can see that when we look at the relative branches uh, in this phylogeny, which are going to represent the amount of change or mutations to the past, we can actually see that the origin of the two species um, was probably sort of at the same time. So um, something else is going on here. I believe that um, there was a case of other type of speciation that is non-bodying. Um, in which it's likely that maybe Clark Kelly and Bulata had a more widespread distribution, and now maybe it's in its way of going extinct, or it's, it's close to going extinct, and then this distribution has contracted. Um, another thing that is interesting, uh, especially if you know this species, is that there are two spots, again, in the road that you can see this species, um, and you can see that in front of the species name, there is an A or a B for that code. So A is one of those spots. B is the R spot. We can see that each one of the spots is monophyletic, um, indicating that there might not be a lot of gene flow between these two populations. Although I um, still need to dig more into the data to make sure that this is true. But at least up to now, this is what the phylogeny is suggesting. And this is, this is very interesting because it sort of contradicts what we thought had happened um, in this specific case or well-studied case of what we thought was uh, body speciation. Um, again, this phylogeny was done using the same um, type of data that was used for Abronian. So this is 353 genes and that were concatenated to build this phylogeny. Um, and I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, this is not the only case in which 
we have found a case of boring speciation not to be boring speciation. And uh, there is a paper by Shelly Sianta and, uh, and Kathleen Kay from a couple of years ago in which they were doing very similar approach to uh, what I showed you, um, testing for boiling speciation in Clarkia franciscana, so another species of Clarkia that again was believed to be for sure a species of boiling speciation. Clarkia uh, franciscana has a very narrow range and it was believed to be derived either from Clarkia amoena or for Clarkia rubicunda. Uh, what Shelley and Kathleen found was that it seemed that these three species diverge at the same time. Um, so you can see this internal branch here is really low and there is actually no support for saying that Franciscana is more closely related to Amoena than to Robicunda or the other way around. Um, so, so that being said, um, I want to point out that building high resolutions is basically the ultimate test. Building high resolution phylogenies is the ultimate test for body and speciation. Uh, Kathleen actually, uh, Shelley and Kathleen say that in that paper and I agree with them. And what is interesting about this is that um, it's telling us that there are also other type of um, processes that are happening that might be really interested. So in, very interesting. So we, we thought that we knew how Franciscana and Lingulata speciated. Now we don't know. So we have to go back um, to thinking about those questions and how to solve them. Um, so that being said, um, those are the two cases that I wanted to present for which we have preliminary results. And um, I want to announce that um, we have, I have uh, one of my uh, grant proposal that I submitted to NSF has been recommended for funding. And we are continuing this type of studies with four species that are common here in the Klamath region, not common, but are present in the Klamath region. It is Simon Mencicii, which is a uh, favorite here. It's endemic to the dunes. Uh, Lupinus Constancei, which is only found in a couple of mountains here in Humboldt County, White Longicaulis and Silene Serpentinicula. These two species in the top are in danger. Um, and we're going to be using different method to uh, infer those phylogenies. We have tentative putative relatives. And in addition to make this test for boiling speciation, uh, we did it right. We also um, want to obtain genetic data about the health of this population for their management and conservation. All right, so I arrived to uh, the end of my presentation. So these are the take home messages. So boiling speciation is super interesting. It seems to be important in the generation of species richness. Uh, there is a lot of signature of it. However, a total testing is necessary for correctly inferring this type of speciation. And we saw a case in which we found it. We saw a case in which we didn't. And um, definitely high resolution phylogenies have the potential to unravel and non nuances about plant speciation uh, that we are about to start uncovering. Um, so that's that's all I have uh, for today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I have my chat open in case anyone wants to put questions there too. <clears throat> Thanks, Oscar. Chris Ivy, would you like to go first? Sorry, I was just applauding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Chris. Peter, you have your hand raised. Yes, uh, thank you. Thanks for the talk, Oscar. Um, so I was wondering, uh, do species tend to bud into habitats where they have relatively low fitness? And does budding speciation come along with a decrease in competitive ability? 
Well, that's that's a great question. Um, I know of cases in which that is true, and actually, Shelley Sianta has a paper on this, and the answer is yes. Uh, we have evidence that that's true. I don't know if that's true for all the cases, um, but at least um, um, Shelley's paper was about serpentine species. So um, serpentine is a really harsh environment, different soil to be a plant and difficult. Um, so she definitely has evidence for that in cases of serpentine um, and they, they, they become uh, worse competitors when they are taken out of that place. But I don't know if that's true for other types of and look ecological divergence. Uh, now thinking about some examples in Clarkia and specifically the work of um, Lewis, um, his hypothesis is that uh, many speciation is happening toward the south, which is a little bit drier. So that also sort of holds that idea that um, they are they they are um, adapting to an environment that's a little bit more difficult than the progenitor species. And if I could just add a comment, I think uh, this relates to some work by uh, a student of Bruce Baldwin's and himself looking at the origins of desert species um, that seemed often to have been derived from species in less arid habitats in the in the Asteraceae. Oh, cool. Yes, and, and Baldwin also has this famous study on, on, on Leia discoidea, which is one of the first cases of documented body speciation. I didn't show that because we didn't have enough time. Uh, but yeah, there is also some literature by uh, Baldwin and collaborators on this. Thank you so much for the comment. Dick, go ahead. Dick Olmsted. Uh, hi, Oscar. That was a really good talk. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm glad Thank that you. I got the announcement in time to, to log in. Um, I was going to also mention Bruce. I was in a symposium with Bruce probably over 20 years ago in which he just went through a whole K, uh, uh, number of studies of progenitor derivative species, mostly based just on ITS sequences, because that's all he had at the time. But I think he's probably got a rich uh, trove of hypotheses that could be tested with more sophisticated methods like you're using. Uh, but my question for you, though, is in the Clarkia case, um, it sometimes is, can be easy to show conclusive evidence for a progenitor derivative case when you have a paraphyletic group of populations and then a monophyletic group of populations nested within them. But to show that they are reciprocally monophyletic requires that you really have uh, extensively sampled the potential pro uh, progenitor species, right? Because you may have missed a few populations that would fall outside. So in your case with Clarkie, I didn't, I don't recall seeing evidence of what your sampling regime was for, not for Lingulata, but for the other species. I've forgotten what it is now. But um, how widespread was that sample then? Yeah, it was it was pretty widespread. So we started. Um, oops, let's go back. So we started up here, sort of in the northern part of the species, and I collected all accessions from all this area, including very close to where Clarkia lingulata is here. So we collected all these different individuals. And I also have samples from this area close to San Francisco. Um, so yeah, it was um, the sampling was pretty widespread, and we're still, you know, dissecting that data. Um, one of the ideas that we have is, um, you know, extract the snips from this data, maybe try to do some coalescent analysis to see what they can tell us about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Paul Wilson, go ahead. Hi, Oscar. Um, yeah, so following up on Dick's comment, 
I, I understand that when you find the putative progenitor to be paraphyletic, that that's, that's kind of a smoking gun. But um, when the putative progenitor is not paraphyletic, I don't really see why you would have conclusive evidence that it's not something like budding speciation. And the second part of my question would be whether uh, finding a lack of odd apomorphies in the putative progenitor could kind of help that out. Yeah, great question. So, um, yeah, so there is, uh, so that's true. You know, it is possible that if body speciation happened really far um, in the past, um, then that signature of um, the, the the progenitor species being paraphyletic is going to be erased with time. However, based on the length of the branches in the phylogeny, um, we can we can see that um, the speciation event was still recent. It is is this is not dated yet, uh, but it seems recent. So. Um, the idea that lineage sorting might have sorted this case, um, I find that unlikely, uh, but it's still a possibility. Um, and we are we haven't looked at any morphological data to answer your questions about apomorphis. Uh, but the main difference between the two species is, as you can see, um, Bailova has two lobes in the pedal, lingulata doesn't, and then the pedals in lingulata are a little bit narrower. Another main difference between the two species is um, the development of the lingulata is a little bit faster than the one of Bailova. So they usually uh, flower two weeks earlier, and then the plants just basically dry up. Um, so when I was collecting this, lingulata was, uh, I almost didn't find flowers. They were all almost gone, but then bilova was in full bloom. So that's, that those were two main difference that at least I could see in the field, but I haven't done any um, formal analysis with this. Thank you. Kieran, go ahead and then I'll move to a few in the chat, but go for it, Kieran. Uh, uh, thanks, Dina. Uh, Oscar, great, uh, great talk. I love being reminded of California flora. It's been a while since I've been back. Um, and I, I was kind of wondering, um, you know, I'm not super familiar on the budding speciation literature other than um, the two papers mentioned in 2013 and 2014, but is there any reason to believe that uh, the budding speciation events, let's say like in the Klamath, um, took place at the same time and, you know, was replicated, but replicated across these different clades. Like, I don't know how old, uh, I don't know when the Klamath orogeny was, but, you know, uh, presumably like that could be the case with the Clarkia, um, 5 million years ago with the Sierra Nevada uplift. Um, I'm just wondering if you, if you have any thoughts on that or if there is evidence to suggest that to be true, like in some of the Sierra, um, examples. Yeah, so well, the so I guess I'm gonna start by saying that the history of the Klamath Mountains is very complicated. Basically, the idea is that all these small mountain regions sort of like were pasted together and just smooshed at different times. So the mountains that are closest to the east of the Klamath regions are gonna be a little bit older than the ones that are here close to the coast because they are all coming from the ocean. Um, but yeah, I believe these mountains are all enough that they predate um, the speciation of many potential endemic species to the Klamath regions. And one thing that is very interesting about the Klamath region is that it has a lot of um, serpentine outcrops. And we have a lot of serpentine endemics or what we live there are serpentine endemics in the Klamath region. So 
just because of these outcrops, and when I am, I'm sorry, I don't have a map of that, but when you look at the outcrops of serpentine in the Klamath region, it's crazy, it's crazy. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of it. So, so we have a good reason to believe that this might be a main driver of speciation in the Klamath region, um, happening at the same time and in other places, um, like the, um, the coastal regions, close to San Luis Obispo, but also in the Sierra Nevada. Cool. There's a question in the chat that is really relevant to both Kieran and Paul's question. So this is from Marshall Hayden. Hayden, sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Related question regarding time rather than space. If there is enough gene flow in the progenitor species, wouldn't the paraphyly be short-lived? an older case of budding could still have an end result of reciprocal monophyly. Question. Yes, so that's correct. So yeah, if there is enough um, gene flow, yeah, that's, that's, that definitely, that definitely could happen. Um, and I don't know what those times could be. And that's something that I think we can potentially explore with coalescence. And I, I love that comment. Uh, definitely something to, to study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. Mm -hmm. um, a few other questions in the chat. One from Amy Litt. Is there any evidence of this in woody perennials? Is there evidence of this in woody perennials? Um, yes. Um, there is evidence of this in, in woody perennials, and I actually wanted to include an example of that. So um, I, uh, in my postdoc in Michigan, we study a lot the Lecithidaceae family. So this is a family with very, very, very large, long-lived trees. Uh, and um, in one of our projects, and this project was... Um, led by, at a time, a student there, Drew Larson, uh, which I helped. He sequenced um, this species that is hyper-dominant in the Amazon, which name is Echuelera coriacei. That's the most common three species in the Amazon forest. And he sequenced other species that are, seems to be closely related to um, Echuelera coriacei. And we were able to see that there are definitely species that are derived from H. Wailer acoriaceae um, that seems to be clear cases of boring speciation. The interesting thing about this case is that um, it could, it could be a case in which you have multiple cases of boring speciation, so multiple a species budding out of Echuelera coriaceae, since this is a widespread species that is very common and hyperdominant in the Amazon. And I believe there is a student of Chris Dick right now that is doing a study uh, looking at these cases. Uh, maybe not from the point of view of budding speciation, but from the point of view of like diversification in the Amazon. Yeah. Cool. There's one last question, which we might squeeze in, um, and it's a neat one. It's by Kay Kelman. Is there evidence that populations of the progenitor that are close geographically to the derivative are closer genetically to the derivative? Um, so that's that's um, that's the hypothesis, right? And that's clearly happening in the case of Abronia. Um, in our Clark, Clark example, um, you cannot really say if there is one population that is closer to Lingulata because right. both each each um, they are both reciprocally monophyletic. So in this in this case, we cannot really say that there is a population that is more closely related to Lingulata. Um, at least phylogenetically, we can potentially do a, another type of genetic analysis to see if there are alleles that are shared uh, using sort of PCA, uh, but I haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. Cool. We have one minute. Peter, go. So, Oscar, in closing, have you any thoughts about the likely evolutionary fates of buds? 
Yes. Um, well, um, so I don't have evidence for any of what I'm going to say, but you know, it has been proposed that voting speciation is happening all the time. And a lot of those bots just go extinct and we never knew that that happened. So um, I think we're, we're getting at the high resolution and we are seeing some of these cases. Uh, while many of these bots have the potential to be new species in the future, I also imagine that many of those also have the potential to go extinct pretty far. And you know, if you connect this with some work that Kathleen Kay has done on the California Floristic Province in which she found that uh, with a collaborator that they found that there is low extinction in California. It makes sense that bots are produced in California and they stay a little bit longer than in other places. They don't go extinct as fast. And this is likely because of the low extinction rates that have been documented for uh, California lineages. Awesome. Thank you so much, Oscar. Everyone give Oscar a round of applause. And I think we should do a whole symposium on this at a conference sometime soon. I think that would be awesome. I agree. Yes. Thank you so much, Dina, for hosting me and everyone for coming to my talk and the great questions. Awesome. Stop the recording. <laughs>